Welcome to session 11. And, and today we have our second panel session that we're going to discuss the architectural practice of the future. Now, we're at, a, we're at a kind of changing times within the architectural profession, and there's lots of challenges that we face in day-to-day -day business. Now, we've got two very exciting guests that I'll be talking to you. First of all, we're talking to Catherine Loke from Land Loke Architects based in Singapore, and Jojo Tolentino from Adia based out of the Philippines. Now, these, these, these practices, they've got very difference in size and scale, but it's very interesting to hear their stories and opinions about some of the challenges that they're facing within their own practices and how they're addressing it and dealing with it to enable their practice to thrive and grow or, in Catherine's perspective, thrive and, and still maintain her practice size that she has. So, mm -hmm. first of all, Catherine, I'd like to pass over to you to just give a, a brief introduction to yourself and your actual practice so that people can understand your perspective and where you're coming from. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Nathan, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I've been in practice for 28 years. I graduated from the University of Melbourne, so I'm quite familiar with practice in Australia as well. Um, and uh, in Singapore, I belong to a two-person practice, myself and my partner, who also happens to be my husband. Uh, so we basically practice architecture 24 hours, 24-7, something like that. Uh, but we, uh, our partnership uh, was, uh, well, I joined the partnership in 1999. Uh, he had another partner who migrated to Perth and then I joined this partnership and we changed the name to Landerloop Architects because we wanted it to reflect our, uh, who we were rather than having a sort of a nondescript name. We wanted it to reflect the partners and basically the way we work is that we're very committed to uh, personal attention to every project. So that was why the name was also important to us. And uh, we actually haven't had staff since 2004. Uh, from 2004 until now, it's been just the two of us. And um, at that time, we weren't using Archicad yet. So we still occasionally subcontracted some of the work, uh, like some of the rendering work, or if we had to produce um, tender drawings and we couldn't cope them. You know, we had contract draftsmen. Uh, but we started using Archicad fully uh, in 2011. And from, and, and we, we don't subcontract any work out anymore because Archicad is able to do all the rendering, all the documentation and everything. And, and in fact, it has given us back the control that we wanted. Uh, uh, and uh, while you say, uh, while it may look like we haven't grown, uh, we, we haven't grown in number, but uh, we've grown certainly in capability and ability. So there are different forms of growth. Um, yeah, and uh, apart from that, I, I'm also uh, involved in regulation of the profession as well as education. So I'm teaching at the university as well. I'm also involved in the examination process for uh, people registering to be architects. So that's kind of in a nutshell what, what I've been doing. One of the things that you just mentioned then, which we will touch on later, is is the ability for your practice to have expanded its services based upon two. Now let's go to a multiplying effect. And Jojo, I think you're a, a firm of about 270 staff or approximately around that, technical staff. Okay. Do you want to give uh, the the audience uh, a little bit of an overview of yourself and, and ADIA as a practice? Okay, thank you, Nathan. And uh Thank you for having us here, having me here. Uh, we started as a small firm, less than 10 people 25 years ago. And, and uh, when we started the firm, our, uh, we all, all saw ourselves not just as a design firm, that we are a design and technology practice. Uh, uh, whatever that meant 25 years ago, uh, we wanted to be uh, invested and leveraged in technology. And uh, through the years, we've uh, been fortunate to be able to differentiate ourselves as uh, not only an architectural firm, but an architectural firm that is progressive, not only in terms of design, but in tools and the way we do processes. So uh, because of uh, that differentiation, we were able to grow the business. From 10, uh, it became, uh, during the Asian crisis, we had about 25 people. Uh, in the global financial crisis in 08, we had about 70 people then. Uh, and so it was a always a, uh, a upward trajectory in terms of uh, growth uh, and uh, growing growth in terms of numbers and growing the business. 
And uh, up to now, uh, in spite of the pandemic, we're able to keep our numbers and didn't have the need to reduce. Uh, we migrated to BIM uh, 16 years ago. Uh, we, uh, we chose Archicad as our BIM tool and uh, primarily because we, we felt that it was best suited uh, for the kind of work that we do. We, uh, we are a, a, a purely design practice. We don't do construction, uh, but at the same time, we uh, felt that there are opportunities brought about by technology that will allow us to expand our design uh, practice into something that goes beyond design. And so that now has become our business model. Uh, we're still growing our design business. There are still opportunities, but we see technology as an enabler for us to do something else other than design, something interesting and something that will allow us to be relevant in a bigger part or the whole part of a building's life cycle. No, well, that's the, the reason why specifically I thought that um, in having this panel discussion, both both you, Jojo, and Catherine bring together, I guess, two ends of the spectrum in terms of the scale and sizes of your practices. But I think that your views and opinions and, and your involvement across industry sectors and, and Catherine with your work with the Institute of Architects in Singapore as well, all of those sorts of things bring a strong conversation to the piece and, and how practices that are using Archicad or practices that are using BIM can move forward and become a, a greater offering moving into the future. So, so starting off with my first question, I think the, the approach from both of you with this is going to be slightly different, hence why I think it's a really good a question to start off with and in terms of looking at the practices of the future and how our architectural practices will look. Now, the first thing we start off with is the challenges that we face within the profession with the erosion of architectural fees. So the, the, our clients, unfortunately, don't value our services as, as great as they used to, and, and they're tr always trying to find cheaper, cheaper alternatives. Now, here yeah. in Australia, specifically, there has been numerous papers that have been produced um, highlighting uh, fee reduction and reduction and a correlation directly to the quality of of documentation dropping, uh, which results in, in, in greater risks. So for, for you, first of all, Catherine, how is your practice, what's, what's your experience with, with those fee issues in Singapore? And I guess, how have you looked to adapt or address those issues in the way in which you approach your clients? Have you got a miracle cure where you're actually able to charge your clients, you know, fees higher anyway, because you deliver greater service? You know, what's, what's your approach? Um, well, looking at Singapore in general, yes, there, there has been a downward uh, pressure on fees. Um, and that's primarily also caused by the public procurement system. Um, because, you know, being a regulated profession, it means that we already meet a certain minimum standard. So at the end of the day, the reality is people are competing on fees, not on quality. Because the assumption, I mean, most of us should be able to deliver quality, otherwise we wouldn't be a registered architects. Uh, so inevitably, the bidding, uh, no matter what the selection criteria is, inevitably, the bidding becomes a fee bidding exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so well, how do we cope? Well, basically, we don't participate. Uh, we, we don't, as a small practice, I think um, you can actually afford to uh, develop maybe niche areas. Um, we rely still entirely on referrals. Um, because we're not having to feed an army of staff, so we don't worry so much. Uh, one of the decisions that we made early on is that if the client wasn't willing to pay the fees that we wanted, we wouldn't take the job. And we would rather rather have more free time to explore things that we want to explore than to work, you know, work yourself to the ground and still not be paid adequately. So that was the approach we took. Uh, and of course, it takes a long time to build up a reputation and it, it takes a long time to build up relationships. So to actually the most important thing, especially for a small practice, in fact, even for a large practice, is the relationships that you have. Um, and you build on those relationships. And um, if, you, if you start off with a certain quality uh, in mind and you don't compromise on that, then the certain types of clients will come to you. Uh, we, we found that 
uh, over the years, um, you know, when we think that, oh, we're, we have a bit more free time now and we want to do something else, someone else will come and want us to do something. So, uh, and it's always a referral from someone else. So I would say that actually in terms of our fees, uh, they haven't gone down. In fact, we are charging more now uh, because of certain niche areas or certain skills that we have that other people don't have. And then the clients who come to us specifically want that. And they specifically want us, uh, as I said, because we, we uh, pay personal attention. So why people come to us is because they want us. Uh, specifically yep. so they're not looking for a low fee they are looking for us uh, so in that way it's not that we charge at exorbitant fees I mean we always look at what's reasonable and then what value we're delivering to the client and we work on that basis and we, we don't participate in fee bidding because it's a fee bidding is actually very very damaging I think for the profession because it's a very very blunt tool the people who are assessing those kinds of um, procurement practices often cannot differentiate the quality or if they do it's on a very superficial basis you know they just take uh, two minutes to look through your portfolio and then decide whether you're good or not uh, so we we don't want to participate in that kind of uh, selection process so jojo on the different scale when when you're feeding you know i i was a director in in, at a, at a, in, a, in a medium-sized practice here in australia for a couple of years before i moved on back in 2019 to to, to do my own thing uh, Catherine is is feeding a beast of two. You're feeding a, a a massive beast, and even in a practice of fifty five, the volume of work that needed to come through the door to pay the bills on a monthly basis is is enormous. Now your multiplier effect is substantially greater than that. So, with regards to fees, and before we talk in detail about the use of technology. How how have you found the challenges, or how are you addressing the challenges of of, of low fees? Well, uh, I just want to say that in my 34 years of being an architect, fee has always been a concern. Yeah. Uh, fees will never go up. And uh, the trend is, of course, there's to pressure architects to lower uh, the fees. But uh, also what we realize uh, in IDEA is that uh, fee uh, is not the end number. It's really profitability and efficiency. So, uh, so our approach uh, in our company is two prong. Number one, uh, we have to address uh, clients' needs in a different way. So, part of it is not technology related or partly technology related. We had to change our design process. Uh, something that's more engaging, uh, that is fresh, that not, that the same stuff that we do 30 years ago. Uh, because clients also have uh, an expectation that uh, the ride has to be uh, enjoyable as well and not just the end, excuse me, the end product. So we, uh, we had to redo all of that, uh, the design process. Second is that uh, we have to, to also understand what the client needs and configure our uh, process so that, uh, you know, in design, it's not one formula that fits all. Uh, clients have very specific needs and we have to be flexible and we have to uh, retool our process such that uh, we really zero in on what they want. Uh, and, and, uh, and third is we have to leverage on technology and with this is where the, uh, the efficiency comes in. If we can do, for example, twice the amount of work with the same number of people, then obviously we can be more profitable. Uh, and we realize that uh, since fees will not uh, will not go down, will not go up, uh, the, the tendency is uh, the interesting thing about architecture or the service industry is as you develop a relationship with clients, the expectation is that you give them better services and better fees. So, so uh, and that's what's happening to us. You know, eighty percent of what of our clients uh, come back to us because they like the service, but at the same time, uh, as they give you volume, they also expect that you give them better fees. So uh, technology to us uh, was one of the biggest tools for us to gain that efficiency. Uh, the second prong to that approach is also to differentiate ourselves. We also accepted that, uh, that the, the, the practice shouldn't just focus on pure design work. We have to redefine also the way our business model 
So I talked about technology, but really uh, the, the reason why we ventured into that is we wanted to explore other income streams uh, that, you know, I always joke people here that will allow us to practice design. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and, uh, so creating uh, different services is important to us. And uh, that's why uh, we looked at different technologies, uh, different uh, partnerships, uh, formed uh, alliances that global in nature. And that uh, to us also became uh, an effective way for us to, uh, to address the fee issue. Yeah, now, I guess moving on to technology, because I think that's, you know, the reason why everyone's here is to learn more about how to get more out of ArchiCAD today. So from, from my perspective, one of the things that I've learned through my career is about effect. So basically the role of the architect is to provide information. Now, the information yeah. is to, uh, we're, we're basically taking a brief from a client, then breaking that brief up and interpreting that brief and then breaking it into packets of information that can be understood by different stakeholders throughout the delivery of a project. The first one being mm -hmm. client stakeholders. So we're communicating the design back to them, explaining how that works. Second one being uh, authorities. So the authorities can, can understand what we're proposing to build. Consultants as well, so that we can communicate cons to consultants. But then fundamentally the end game being obviously most of the time we're producing documentation and outputs for a builder mm -hmm. to be able to build our design intent. Now, the technology enablers, one of the things that I've found really important is the communication to stakeholders and, and making sure that they understand how a building goes together and changing our ways. You know, the architect of the past, you know, JJ, the thing, one thing you talked about there that rang, rang true to me is, is being able to deliver value to a client, understanding what their needs are. So if you turn around and and I remember presenting numerous times to nurses and, and, and educators and teachers and principals of schools. And we would be in a situation whereby we, we don't want to be putting plans in front of them anymore because they're not, they're not trained to read architectural drawings. They're trained to teach, right. teach our children. So that's where the visualization and the technology of, of that helps. So Catherine, moving on into the technology side, being a small practice, obviously, it's challenging to implement, you know, dozens of tools to to enable you to compete, you know, and do all these different things like the bigger practices. But do you want to give us a little insight into, I guess, the way in which your practice is using technology to assist you, a small practice of only two, to to be able to deliver, you know, the, the work you do? Um, well, uh, actually, nowadays the technology has replaced. Um, Certain, certain some work has been replaced by technology, as in some people have been replaced by technology. Uh, for instance, drafting. Uh, actually, there are two things that are the most challenging for any architect, regardless of what tools you use, and that's uh, coordination and communication. So these are the two things where the most mistakes happen and where the uh, greatest degree of risk lies. So when we look at Archicad as a tool, we really using it to help us uh, address these two things so that we can then focus our energy on doing the things that we enjoy. Um, and design being an iterative process, uh, the tool has really helped us. In terms of coordination, we are able to, co uh, to communicate much better with the rest of the project team uh, by being able to generate all the information from one platform, which we could never do before. So in the past, you know, everyone was sort of working in isolation. And then when people sent us their information, we had to check to make sure there's no discrepancy. Whereas now from the Archicad um, file itself, we can actually export in so many different formats to suit the people that we work with. So basically what we uh, believe in is being flexible. It's like being multilingual. Uh, so with Archicad, you can be so-called multilingual because, you know, the person you're working with doesn't have to adapt to you, you can adapt to them. Uh, so you don't have to dictate to, to the people you're working with that, oh, we all must use the same tool. Uh, you can be very flexible and say, yeah, whatever tool you use, I'll give you the information in whatever form you, you, you need. You know, so that's really, really important for us. Um, 
And in terms of uh, design being an iterative process, it also really helps that you have this one source. So for every iteration, uh, every input from other people, we can then generate the outputs to the rest of the team. Uh, and uh, if you talk about um, you know, um, competing with larger practices, uh, basically the two of us, what we like to tell people is that uh, we have two designers, we have two draftsmen, we have two renderers, uh, we have two everything. But we have one BIM manager, one person to make sure the standards are compliant. with. <laughs> so that's how we, we multiply, actually. <laughs> Two to no, the power of whatever it is we need to do. But I think, I think the interesting part with that is that as a practice, you've adapted and, and continued your skill and, 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 and transformed yourself from you know, hand drafting in the past through to a CAD program through to, to through to BIM authoring and it demonstrates that even a small practice can be highly competitive and and take back those decisions that you're doing now Jojo the, the thing that I get excited about the most is is seeing the power of some of the the technology and automation that you've put together uh, in some of the presentations that you've done uh, with Graphisos key client conferences mm -hmm. uh, over in Budapest um, I remember seeing, I think it was probably two or three years ago and with, with COVID now, it seems like only yesterday, but it wasn't so many years ago that, that, you've, that you've talked about some of the stuff that you've done. So I'm, I'm keen for you to share with, with the audience some of the kind of the methodology, well, you know, a high level, I guess, because of the things, the technology you're using to drive your practice um, forward. Yes, thank you, Nathan. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, migrating from 2D to 3D wasn't an easy journey for us. Uh, we started 16 years ago, uh, I remember, when uh, we, we said that we have to look for the next level up. Uh, we are growing as a business. Uh, the question is, should we keep on hiring people? or should we look at the technology that uh, will allow us to move to work more efficiently? And uh, if the time comes that we're convinced that we're already efficiently working, uh, then there's a time that we hire. And so uh, technology, uh, BIM, allowed us to do that. Uh, I was convinced myself that uh, BIM is the future, that you know, if we do BIM right, uh, it will uh, result in a lot of opportunities, efficiencies for the business. But as I mentioned, uh, going through there was not easy. Uh, one thing we realized, first of all, is that uh, you know the trainings, hardware, uh, investment, all of those can be managed. But what's difficult to manage are people and people's mindset. Uh, we had, I remember about 60 people when we transitioned to BIM. And uh, of course, not all of them were believers. In fact, there were just a few diehards. The rest were open-minded, uh, but I would say 50% were skeptical. And it's also a result of our own success because uh, before BIM, we uh, uh, trained people to be 2D experts, to be AutoCAD experts. And human nature, when you're an expert in something, you don't want to give it away. In uh, the technology that is very new, which means that you lose your competence uh, because you know, from an AutoCAD expert, uh, you have to transition to in, you know, during the time we were uh, doing a lot of ARCHICAD transitioning, yeah, which we, we, uh, we, uh, we started uh, our ARCHICAD transition. So that was a difficult part for us, uh, managing people's mindset. And truth be told, uh, some people had to go because they were not willing to change. And uh, those who were uh, open to uh, doing the change and learning new things, after a year, they said that that is one of the pivotal moves that the company has done. Uh, that we, uh, we moved to a new technology and we had the result to do it. And uh, Nathan, you heard from my presentation before that we also went cold turkey, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, <laughs> moving to BIM. Uh, we set a date uh, and we told everyone on this day, we're going to take out all the 2D software uh, and for better or for worse, we'll move to this new uh, platform. And uh, let's just, God bless us, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> and so that day happened and it was chaotic. 
it has it was difficult for six months uh but you know i think to the determination of the firm to just uh go over the difficult period we we're able to stabilize uh the system uh, and learn the platform learn the technology and in a year's time no one is even questioning why we ever did that uh and uh, one of the promise i often hear is now that we know bim the, you know people don't understand why why other firms have to stick to 2d because that's such a prehistoric <laughs> that's their term uh, technology and and very inefficient so so that was a big move for us now uh, well, uh one one uh, several things we learned uh during transition number one it has to be it has to come from the top meaning management has to fully support uh the transition to bin it is not like uh just changing drafting uh software uh it involves changing the whole process in the office uh the whole delivery process uh we we learned that when you do bim you don't have draftsmen you have you you train architects architects who know how to design to build structures and to, to detail and bim is just uh an, a, a tool for them so so that that position of draftsman went away which is good for us uh second is that uh bim transition has to be supported by everyone in the organization it's not just uh the the, the uh, technical persons affair uh this uh uh responsibility or the designers our hr department has to provide training has to provide let's say a skills need and a uh, skills need analysis and bring in the experts that can cover our gap our finance people obviously have to support it financially our it people have to make sure that we have uh, the latest uh, equipment uh fast uh, lines and all these things that uh, are needed to make our migration successful so uh even our qa process has changed um because we're working with beam models we had to uh rely a lot on solibri for example to do our qa work not only in beam uh in in a uh, the correctness of the BIM model, that's one thing, but even our code uh, and design compliance have to be done uh, you know, using digitally, uh, using Solibri. So we're very heavily uh, invested in Solibri as well. Uh, that whole thing, uh, that whole end-to-end -end process uh, in design, questioning ourselves, do we need this software? uh taking out sketchup in the system which is a big battle configuring our you know our you know configuring our system so that uh we can work efficiently uh, was a result of many years of trial and error uh, until we reach a point where we said okay we're we're working well on this but we still feel that there is something missing and that is when uh we thought of creating a software writing division so that we can uh, work on Archicast API and uh, write scripts and code so that whatever could be coded, uh, we you know can, should be explored uh, so that we can work even more efficiently. So I, I think about six or seven years ago we created that team and that's paid off dividends for us because now uh, that uh, those internal tools were very important for us uh, becoming more efficient and also for us delivering work fast with the same quality. Now, uh, so we, our capability in technology became a source of pride for the business. So we're regarded in our country at least that uh, to be one of the more advanced, if not the most advanced uh, company when it comes to technology. And people join us not only for learning design but learning technology as well which we like uh, we attracted partners worldwide who want to work with us not only in design but also to share our knowledge in technology so that's uh, gratifying uh, for us and 16 years down the road uh, when you talk to people here in in our company the question always is what what's the next thing that we're going to do what's the next level up we call it quantum leap what's the next quantum leap for the firm because of course 
uh, BIM will be mainstream uh, very soon. And what we want to do is uh, we want to uh, again see where we want what other break uh, uh, what other breakthrough technologies can we uh, venture in so that uh, we could always be ahead of the curve, so to speak. Uh, yes. Then on the yeah on the business side, uh, I mentioned about automation that also became uh, a business opportunity for the firm. Now, uh, when we did presentations like what you saw in Budapest, Nathan, uh, after those presentations, we get questions from participants if we can sell the technology or share it. And we decided last year that we're going to make uh, another spin-off technology business out of it. So again, it's uh, AEC related. It, it started with us using it as a design tool uh, and it turned into another opportunity for the firm. So that's how we organically are growing the business. So the, the thing that really excites me about this, and it's something that I've been passionate about whenever I'm trying to implement anything in, in, in workflows or how we're supposed to address things is to actually remove the mundane tasks from what you're doing to then enable you to practice architecture. architecture. So from Catherine's perspective, yeah. it's, it's actually about getting back in hands on and delivering a project, understanding how a building goes together and doing and executing it. Whereas from ADS perspective, it's, it's how can we how can we get people to build models, which is essentially the part which the architect needs to be really skilled in, and then yeah. the the back end is automated so that on these major projects you can you can produce the outputs substantially quicker. The one thing yeah. that I've found over my over my tenure in in the profession is is actually the challenges that we face, um, and this could be a whole whole panel discussion in itself, but I don't want to go off on it too far, but the challenges of of actually finding um, skilled architects that actually understand, first of all, how buildings go together, and secondly, how to produce a set of documents. Yeah. Now, that could be a whole yeah. panel discussion in itself, but from my mind, that's kind of some of the things where, Catherine, that's why I think you've probably taken the steps where you've taken, where you've used technology to enable you to do the work yourself rather than actually um, have, to, have to deal with the challenges of under-skilled yeah. staff. Yep. And Jojo, how 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 do you, how are you finding it in, in the Philippines specifically with finding skilled architects and knowing how buildings go together? I guess on a, in a short note, <laughs> rather than a yeah. whole thesis. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we see BIM as a tool, and that as a uh, we, it, it's a tool for architects to work better. In other words, when we recruit. We're looking for people who understand design and understand how buildings are put together. And we equip them with Archicad uh, as a tool. So they go, they go through uh, a one week training in the firm. Uh, previously, now we only have, we only need three days and the rest uh, they learn by doing projects. So there's a series of training that they go through. Uh, we're very strict in terms of our protocols. Uh, they just have to learn all of that uh, to know how to do a project well. But uh, our objective really, Nathan, and our target is not to get people who are even BIM literate. To us, that's not a requirement. We'll provide the training for as long as they have the design interest and that they really want to become a multifaceted architects. So architects are exposed not only in design, but in detailing and also executing their designs on site. You know, that the, your, your views align with me perfectly. It, it always frustrates me when uh, I see ads for an architect, uh, a software architect, uh, being a, either Archicad or Revit, and you kind of go, well, no. Mm -hmm. if, if you're just fixated on someone that can use a tool, you know, what are you after? You're just after someone that just sits there and just produces outputs but doesn't actually think. But the, all of us are very much in agreement about what that means in terms of having a practice of, of helping the profession and architects actually grow and, and contribute to the to the uh, you know to to the world in a positive limelight. Yeah. Now to close yeah. out, let's let's close this one out with with the with the most challenging question of all, and and it's probably multi prong prong because that's just the way I think and it makes it hard to answer answer the questions, but. I guess where do we see the profession in a decade's time? You know, how will we be? Will our clients' expectations change, or are they still going to be the same? You know, are they going to expect to see you know holographic projections of their projects before they're built, or or the like? Uh, 
you know, how do we see procurement changing, which will that will then change the way in which information is produced or, you know, will the tasks or the role of the architect change? I guess that's a very big bundled question and it could take an hour to answer that as well. But Catherine, what, what's your thoughts on your practice moving into the next decade? Um, well, Nathan, I think 10 years is not that far away. No. Uh, you know, when I look back 10 years and look at where we are, uh, it's it's a progression from where we are now. Uh, but one thing that remains timeless, is, I, I think the architect's role uh, is quite a timeless one. Um, you know, if you remember what uh, Vitruvia said, uh, commodity, firmness and delight. Um, you know, we have to achieve these three things regardless of what tools we use. And I think that um, in a decade, it's really for us as uh, members of this profession to prove to the market that we can deliver uh, and deliver the commodity firmness and delight uh, and use whatever tools are available. So um, I find, you know, some of these sort of VR things and a lot of it is very gimmicky. Uh, and I always go back to uh, communication, like what does the client understand? You know, we are serving the client. So when we design something, what does the client understand? And I find it's quite ironic nowadays, we can produce really, really photorealistic uh, mm -hmm. renderings, but it doesn't mean the client understands that. Even that, you know, even if, you know, you, you can say, okay, layman can't read a technical drawing, right? But we, for one project, we produce 300 over perspectives of every room, every corner, you know, and uh, even then, you know, you still get this situation where the clients on site and going, going oh, uh, oh, I didn't know it was like that, you know, and it's like, you know, like I've done so many perspectives, but, you know, so really for us, we have to remember what our role is and that uh, we are serving the client and we have to communicate with whatever tools. And if we can fulfill that, um, then we will still be relevant. And, and the most important thing I think uh, is our role as master builder that, you know, we seem to have forgotten uh, a lot of architects have become managers and then uh, they've forgotten this master builder role, a lot of architects pass on the detailing to the builder and start doing it, you know, figuring out the construction. Uh, if we keep pushing this away, then someone else will come in to fill the void. Uh, so to me, using Archicad or any other tool, uh, maybe even in a decade's time, I might not be using Archicad anymore. This is something I keep telling the graphics of guys as well. You know, I keep telling them, hey, you guys, um, you know, you've got to keep improving. Otherwise, I'm going to ditch you somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, if we remember the objective, we remember what our role is, and then uh, we will still be relevant and whatever tools are available then will be what we'll be using. Yeah, uh, I, it, the, the, the tool situation is, is the truth. The tools are going to come and go, but the architectural profession yeah. will and, remain relevant. And actually, relevant. Uh, one, one big change I see is uh, there will be more networking because already we, we are doing that, uh, collaborating with other people. Uh, and, you know, teamwork on Archicad is great. Uh, in fact, 20 years ago, we were thinking, oh, we don't want to build up a practice with a traditional structure, with a hierarchical structure, different departments. We want to build up a network. But 20 years ago, the technology didn't enable us to do that. Yeah. And now, you know, finally, the technology has, um, has uh, enabled us. And because of COVID-19, you know, we're... Uh, look at this panel discussion. We're in three different countries, and yeah. we can make it just fine. And uh, you know, with Archicad, uh, Beam Cloud, you can work with anyone anywhere in the world just fine. It's no difference. Uh, so I see in a decade that there'll be many, many more opportunities to network. Uh, small practices with small practices, or small with big or medium. Different practices of different skill sets can very easily come together and work on a project. No, it, it certainly is. Now, JJ, your take on the future, considering how far you're pushing and with, with what you're doing within your business, and obviously the fact that you've now set up a separate business arm to deal with technology, you know, what's, what's your vision for, the, for, the, for a decade's time? Well, I, there are things that are true uh, many years ago that will still be true 10 years from us, what uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, the uh, ability to do design, great design, uh, to serve his clients well, and to become, to practice as, a, as professionals in the design business. Uh, 
but to me, uh, in the future, that will become the entry point. Uh, in other words, you cannot succeed in the design business unless you have uh, those qualifications. But other than that, I al we also recognize that the world is changing. So in our view, uh, there are five things that we're looking at. Number one is as architects, uh, we are designers and we have to use our design, our position as uh, the, the lead designers, as the master builders to be more relevant. Uh, in a bigger life cycle of the project. Yeah. Uh, we only focus on design, for example, and construction, uh, but not focus on the post-construction part. But we have all the information, the data, that will allow us to participate in that phase of the project. That to us is important. Second is uh, we see ourselves as integrators of talent, of skills, of technology, and of knowledge. Uh, in the past, uh, everything has to be done in-house. Uh, and it has uh, changed quite uh, slowly through the years. But now with technology, uh, we can source anything anywhere in the world. We just have to have a mindset that not everything has to be procured in-house, that uh, we have access through technology of whatever we need globally. Uh, we just have to use a flat, uh, the right platform. Uh, the delivery process will also change. Uh, in many countries, uh, including the Philippines, we still work on the old 2D approach. And we're slowly changing that in our practice where we no longer do SD, DD, CD. Uh, those are in our view things of the past. Uh, we, we, uh, we're changing our workflow such that it is front-ended. We get information upfront, make decisions upfront and execute based on those decisions and use technology to execute faster. Uh, I personally feel that coding and, uh, and uh, writing software shouldn't be a specialty. It should, every architect in the future should have a degree of knowledge when it comes to writing codes and writing uh, codes so that they can solve problems more efficiently. Uh, and then the last for me is uh, since we are now going to be in a borderless economy, a borderless world, uh, we have to be open to cross-border working. And it's not only technology, it's not only having the right uh, cloud solution, it's also having a mindset, understanding that cultures are different, time zones are different, things are done in different places are different. It's not wrong, it's just different, right? And for us to, to succeed in cross-border working, we need to accept those differences and build on those ideas so that we can uh, we can collectively come up with more superior solutions. Well, guys, we've we've run out of time, and we're going to hand over to questions with the audience. But I guess the key takeaway from me from sitting down and speaking with you both today is the the focus on the fact that both businesses, both practices, have adopted change. It has to be led from the led from the directors and the owners of the practice. If it's not, then, then, then it's forget about it. And finally, and I think this is the most important thing and a lot of things that, that people have already touched on today will is to do with the fact that you can have all of the technology that you like, you can have all the processes and tools that you like, but without people, you've got nothing. So what yeah. we'll do now is we'll hand over to the uh, question and questions with the audience. So I hope you guys really enjoyed that panel discussion uh, in regards to our views on the, the, the architectural practice of the future. Uh, we see a couple of comments coming through. Um, yes, my cat did interject at my end. Um, he, 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 has, he has struggled today with me being in a separate room and, not being, and being away from him. He uh, hasn't liked it that much. So that's the kind of positive I guess you could take away from <laughs> from a bit of fun and, 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 and live broadcasting. But uh, there's an interesting concept about the challenges, I guess, about around fees. And uh, first of all, um, looking at the, the concepts of, you know, how doctors and lawyers don't, uh, don't uh, fee bid and, and cut fees. And, you know, it's one of those things that I think the architectural professions are, are the biggest problem within themselves and, and Jojo you talked about yourself 
how you don't experience that and also Catherine that's something you don't experience because of the, the client base that you have and <clears throat> I think we could talk quite generally about the the challenges of the fee bidding war and and I think mm -hmm. I don't want to I don't think that's worthwhile going on about in, in long duration because uh, you know we could be talking about it for quite some time and not um, but yeah, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing the profession has to do, and I personally believe that the reason why we're in that position is because um, architects aren't business people, and if architects were more business oriented instead of being creatives, and and I can tell you now a lot of architects think more as an architect than a business person when they're performing architecture, so that's where I think the fee bidding comes in. David David makes a really good comment, um, Jojo, here about um, bold move going cold turkey. He took six months to transition. Um, uh -huh. So from your perspective, still the best decision you ever made? Yes. Well, uh, yes, in hindsight. Uh, otherwise, uh, we don't know how we would have ended <laughs> if we did it right. Yeah. And, and Catherine, it's an interesting thing. We, you know, today we're, we're participating in this event. The event is talking reasonably um, about advanced, you know, some of the sessions are the, the, the higher end of, of, of learning in terms of skills. You know, what's your kind of suggestion for maybe some of the delegates that are attending today that are, that are just started with Archicad? Uh, well, the way we started, we didn't go cold turkey. Actually, it took us a couple of years to figure out how to get on board, you know, because when you have pressing deadlines, it's not easy to just stop and use a new software. But uh, I would say choose a project that's not too big and not too complicated and perhaps a client that is uh, able to make decisions fairly promptly. Uh, that's quite rare, but uh, <laughs> you choose something simple to start with. Um, and then don't don't uh, be too ambitious, like don't try and achieve all the things you saw at today's conference. Uh, but for a start, like our very first project, what we did was we documented it in AutoCAD. So the design was already done at that time in AutoCAD and SketchUp. And then uh, at that point in time, the client had already signed off the design. So without having to worry about resolving the design anymore, we decided, okay, we're going to redo the whole thing in Archicad and take it forward from there. And, and from then, uh, our documentation, tender documentation was from Archicad fully. Uh, and of course, at that point, being beginners, um, some of the things, of course, we cheated and did 2D touch up, you know, but as we progressed, it, after the first project, you have your template in place. And with every project, we uh, try to explore additional tools uh, until, in fact, it took us like about a year before we went like completely Archicad. Uh, and that was also by choice because as we got more uh, conversant with it, then we stopped using other tools at design stage. So it's really a matter, uh, you know, the most important thing is to get started. I think the most difficult uh, thing when you're a beginner is that you are just too scared to start. <laughs> Uh, so I would say, uh, get started, don't be afraid. Uh, if you are an AutoCAD user, you're actually not starting from zero because there are certain concepts that you do understand. You do have office systems, you do have layering systems, you do have drawing numbering systems already. So, uh, you know, you, you actually are already able to organize your work. So all you need to do is translate that into AutoCAD and then start building up your template together with the project. That's the best way. Because then you can, um, you know, the, the conversation on templates earlier on about talking about what kind of outputs you want to mm. produce, right? So if you are starting with Archicad, then think about the outputs. So our very first project, we just told ourselves, okay, don't be too ambitious. We are producing 2D outputs. So our tender drawings, uh, the benchmark to us was that our, our standard cannot drop. So the the tender drawings that we produce must be on par with the AutoCAD drawings that we used to produce. So that was our first first level, uh, entry level target. Then from there, you know, we built up our capability as we went along. Yeah, now Francois is still still going strong in South Africa. So um, <clears throat> he, he's agreeing with you in terms of management needing to be committed uh, for to get to that next level in BIM, you can't get there unless it's supported from an ownership level. 
and he's seen them fail. Uh, and, 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 and how true is that when, when there's no true belief in, in what you're doing? And, and the sad thing is, is we don't have people on here that have failed. Now, that probably would have been a good counterpoint to um, our discussion, and, but nobody likes talking about failing, do they? Um, he also talks about learning by doing requires exceptional systems, uh, exceptional systems for workflows, protocols, and skills development. It applies to any practice, big and small. Now, I think this would be interesting. Um, obviously, in a, in a larger practice, it's, it's quite easy to have resources, Jojo, in place to document processes and work workflows. Catherine, taking the other end of the stick, yeah. a small practice with one or two people, as, an, as yeah. a sole practitioner, it's quite all right because your standard is your own. <laughs> But uh, um, how, 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 how easy or how hard is it when you have two people uh, working in office that might work slightly different? How do, how do the systems work in a two-person well, team? Uh, basically, I'm the BIM manager. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a systems person, actually. I like things to be very organized. Uh, and it's not just for BIM. We, yeah. Our office system, uh, I came up with the office system. So we have office procedures, templates, etc. for everything, not only for BIM. Uh, it's extremely important, even if you're a single person only, you, you know, you might think that if you're alone, then uh, you know what you're doing and you don't need a system. That's not true because we're dealing with so much information. Mm. Just on one project, you're dealing with so much information from the client. You're trying to comply with authorities' requirements. You're trying to manage your risks. You've got to keep records not only during construction, uh, but also after that. You need to archive your, your material as well. So with, you have to have a system because you will never remember what you did. If you're running a few projects uh, in one go, uh, within, uh, you know, like, do you remember what you did two weeks ago? Do you remember what you said? If you didn't write it down, if you, if you didn't have a system to record things, and, and you, if you didn't have a proper filing system and you didn't have a backup system, even as a single person, you're never going to be able to find your information. So to me, it's extremely important, regardless of the size of practice. Yeah. Uh, that you must have a system. Now, there's a little bit more banter going on here. Ralph talks about coding being the future. Um, JJ, one of your uh, uh, co-workers, one of your team members is on there talking in zeros yeah. and ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, obviously, you got him... Pro uh, obviously, you got them programmed very well. Um, <laughs> so, Joel, this is... I think this is... A, he's got a comment at the start and then a question. So... Joel has said it's a great presentation, uh, truly inspiring as a young architect trying to implement new technologies in his, within his practice. So thanks very much for attending today. So he's wondering, on the subject of automation, um, Jojo, we didn't go too far into this. Uh, how far do um, automation and scripts go in your practice? Now, there's some great presentations that you've done in the past. Do you want to talk briefly about the automation that you have and, and the APIs that you've set up at ADIA? Yeah. Okay. Uh, our strategy has been to automate the, uh, initially the back end of our design process because when we analyze uh, where we take a lot of time and what kind, what work uh, tend to be repetitive, it's really the back end, the production side. And frankly, that's also how where we burn a lot of our fees. So our objective to make it efficient is to automate that part initially, that part of uh, the, our workflow. So the automations we did, uh, we've automated uh, the mentioning, creating executive summaries, linking the specification to the to the BIM. So it auto uh, it creates automatic specification clauses. Uh, we've also uh, done the uh, production automation, which is still uh, it con it's constantly being developed. But the objective is to create a very detailed BIM model so that the detailed drawings come out automatically out of the BIM. So schedules, door schedules, window schedules, finisher schedules are all automated. And uh, you know, very shortly, it will be all linked into one complete package. Not so that. once we're done with that, then there's a time that we uh, create automation on the front end. Yeah. And, and that's purely, I think, a, a, a perfect way to close out this panel. It's mm -hmm. about architects being um, smart and finding ways in which we can remove mundane tasks that, that can be done by computers where, so architects can be more creative and, and be part of the process and why we're in it in the first place. So Jojo and, and Catherine, thank you very much 
for participating in today's event and assisting uh, me to make this event what it is and in, inspiring young people like Joel um, early in his, in his profession. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you for having us. us. And uh, if anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, just send me a connection <laughs> request. Yeah, same here. I'm on LinkedIn. Go to Tolentino anytime and uh, yeah. just send me a message. And hopefully, and hopefully there will be a time when we can connect in face-to-face -face again when, when the world yes. gets back to normal. Yeah. Anyway, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank and, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes with our, with our next session.